Okay, welcome to this discussion where we are going to talk about venture capital business and especially the outlook of the venture capital business in the current situation in the world. And uh, uh, as we all know, the, the, the whole situation in the world at the moment is a little bit confusing. We had COVID time, we have the war in Ukraine, and we have also high inflation. We have also seen how the stock market has gone down uh, the last six months. So that there are many question marks at the moment. And today we are going to discuss that, uh, can we conclude something that, how, how is the outlook uh, for the market? We can start by introductions. Uh, uh, maybe, uh, James, you can start. It's Greg. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. No, no, sorry. Right. James come. Yeah. Yeah, so sorry. Greg Bedrosian, um, co-founder and CEO of Drake Star Partners. We're a technology focused investment bank. So we provide M&A and corporate finance um, advice to tech companies globally. Um, we operate out of eight offices worldwide. Um, so very, very expert and active on the capital formation and exit strategy of these venture cap businesses. Um, additionally, um, I'm a non-executive chairman of a technology focused private equity fund called Da Vinci Capital. That is um, a fund that invests um, mainly in emerging markets, including some of the markets that have been affected by the Russia Ukraine war. And so um, can certainly um, with my private equity hat on, comment on some of those. So great to be here and I'll pass it back to you. Thank you. And Brett, uh, maybe you can then make your introduction. Brett Hickey, founder and CEO of Star Mountain Capital. We manage uh, just over $3 billion, exclusively focused on US and Canadian lower middle market. We don't invest specifically in what we think of as venture capital directly, but rather companies that have a minimum of 15 million of annual revenue. I think venture capital and private equity, sometimes those definitions get blurred, but we are uh, experts in finding high quality established companies and taking them to the next level. We have a lending division, a minority structured equity division, a control private equity investing division, and we also have a secondaries business where we purchase assets and limited partnership interests from those looking for early liquidity. Market dynamics like today, of course, have a lot more people looking for early liquidity. And so we have, um, I think, probably the most comprehensive set of information on the U.S. lower market today with a portfolio on an aggregate basis of approximately 500 private companies. Thank you. Um, and uh, very briefly about myself, um, my background is especially uh, tech entrepreneur. I have started many companies, um, uh, built business uh, globally around the world, and also uh, done quite a few startup investments. And I have operated especially on early phase uh, startup companies. If we start to talk about the situation, um, as I said, there are definitely many uncertainties at the moment. But if we think that what would be the best way to summarize the market at, at the moment, if we start a kind of top-down approach, how would you describe the situation in the venture capital market at the moment? Uh, Craig, can you start? Uh, sure. Well, look, it's, it's certainly a period of great transition and, and um, volatility. We've, we've lived in an era where um, venture funding through to some of the credit funding that uh, you know, Rick's firm does to the public markets have been um, thoughtful but free flowing. We now have with macro, the macro scene you painted from a Russia-Ukraine war to um, rising inflation to very volatile public markets with the Nasdaq down, you know, some 30% in the tech, you know, the tech index and, and many, many famous tech companies 
with their stock prices down over 50%. Um, there's, a, there, there's, there's a tension in the venture market around um, valuation, around whether a business is cash flow positive or negative in terms of whether they can grow and thrive in the coming um, in the coming year or so. And so it's a big shift from an era before where capital was much more free flowing. I think there still remains opportunity, um, but it's a very it's, it's a different mindset that starts to sink in. That's at least my 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 lens on the market top down. Correct. I, I would add on top of it in agreement with what Greg said, uh, w the way we like to frame things at Starman Capital is to think about at a macro level, which industries are more poised for growth. Uh, we think in terms of probability management, and we want to focus on end sectors that have a higher probability of being successful. So if they're growing end markets that have increased demand, that's a good starting point uh, versus markets that are much more volatile, like energy sector, commodities, as an example, you can make money doing that. It's just not what we are specialists in. And again, we're really focused on trying to achieve the highest probability of our desired outcomes as possible. So we try to mitigate volatile end sectors and find sectors that are growing, which is one of the reasons that we are exclusively focused on the lower middle market, because in that segment of the U.S. economy, which represents approximately 50% of US GDP over the last uh, many years, those businesses have grown revenue relative to the S&P 500 companies faster and less volatile. So again, that makes it easier to be right as an investor. Another big macro current that I think has been underappreciated over the past decade or so is capital inflows and what I like to call the basic laws of supply and demand. And Greg alluded to it in valuations, right? When supply demand intersect and you have a lot of demand for something, valuations go up. And whether that's a commodity, a house, or a tech stock. And so in the lower middle market with private businesses, the companies are harder to find, more time consuming to underwrite and invest in especially when you overlay that it's smaller dollars that you're deploying relative to the larger markets. As a result of that, it's kept capital um, less liquid and less money has poured into it over the last decade. And that has, uh, we believe, mitigated a lot of the dynamics of hypervaluations in the large markets. Um, our view for the last six years have been that a lot of things in the larger markets are overvalued and that the geopolitical and other risks have been quite high. I'm not here to try to time the markets on behalf of anybody because that's a very tough job and most people don't get it right often and probably attribute more success to luck than in fact um, really a data-driven analysis to it. At least that's what, again, probability you know, weighted information would tell you. And so we try to avoid those market dynamics and timing market sentiment and really focus on fundamentals. Unfortunately, because the larger and public markets are so competitive, even if you're a great fundamental investor, the problem is if other momentum-based investors drive something up, that's the price you have to pay. So you're either in or out. Um, keeping to macro a little bit, I think that geography is an important consideration. Uh, living here in the U.S., uh, and being a Canadian, so I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm biased towards anything. I do love the U.S. I love Canada and, and the whole world for that matter. But the U.S., while far from perfect, I believe that its governance, economy, entrepreneurship is in far better shape than most other markets in the world. Putting some of the emerging market question marks uh, aside for a moment, you talk about the infrastructure in the U.S. and recent bills passed, and there's lots of infrastructure needs in the U.S. Once again, far from perfect. But for those of us that have spent a lot of time in Europe and other markets, I think that we would probably agree that the U.S. is generally in much better shape compared to most places in the world. And when you think about the public markets as a result of that, if you want to invest in a U.S.-based publicly traded company, you pay a premium, right? There's a premium to access this marketplace. You don't have to pay that premium, generally speaking, in our opinion, 
in the private lower mill market. So we believe that is a bit of a geographical arbitrage as we think about the world today and the, the dramatic challenges. And in Europe, for example, one of the strongest economies, Germany, has a massive percentage of its economy reliant on exports into China and Asia. Um, given the slowing that we're starting to see there, that's going to be interesting to see what happens in Europe in general. I think most people would agree that a united Europe is not really what we are seeing, which was the hope. Um, and there's a lot of different challenges related to fundamental different views, governance, just the, the difficulty it is to get things done in what in the aggregate a big economy, but has a lot of microcosms at a country by country level. And so as we go macro down in from our view, I think you want to get the sectors right. I think you want to try to find the right end of the economy that probability is on your side. And then you get into the, the deeper aspects that I think today you, everybody should be hyper focused on, which is inflation. And while that's nothing new, what inflation and stagflation means, it means prices and costs of goods are going up from labor to goods. And what concerned us at Star Mountain years ago was that it wasn't just the price of goods. When people are like, are we going to have inflation or not? We very clearly in public said, absolutely, in our view, we are. And there was a really simple reason behind that. We were seeing wage pressure. If you think about that, the cost of oil can go up, can go down very quickly, right? Basic supply and demand. But how do you all of a sudden decrease wages for people, right? For those of us that manage a lot of people, once wages go up, it is hard to pull those wages down. So for us, we saw that systematically across sectors from finance to tech. And I don't know how that changes without where we're heading into now, ultimately layoffs and a recalibration, which takes time and probably will. And so I think a focal point for all businesses needs to be the ability to handle increased cost pressure and how much margins do they have, because they may not be able to push prices up. You're seeing it in, in retail weakness right now where people just say, I'm not willing to pay that price. So I get your costs are coming up. I get your margins are lower, but as a consumer, they still don't have to buy. And so I think there's going to be a lot of companies that if they don't have their balance sheets in shape, which usually means low leverage, um, they might have a really tough time withstanding some of the increased inflation cost pressures. And we think that that is going to be something that's going to put a lot of pressure on the, enti on the entire uh, economy. Maybe we can actually continue from that to the valuations and especially not only think sectors, but think also the different phases of the startup companies when we especially talk about the venture capital market. So that starting from a seed phase to series A, B, C, and, and then basically pre-IPO. Do you see that there are significant differences that, for example, this situation is especially difficult for the certain phase company and it might even help some companies in, in, in some other phases. Craig, what you think? Sure, I can, I can weigh in. I mean, it's, it's a great question um, because, you know, companies at the venture stage, as you point out, are not all alike um, at all, right? There's, there, I can bifurcate it into a couple of elements. Um, one is um, in terms of valuations themselves, um, venture, is different from the public markets as we've both been talking about on the panel, um, but venture investors will look to the public markets as a cue. And so if, if larger software recurring revenue businesses, which are, which have gotten a lot of investment capital because of the predictability and the growth of a, a software or a SaaS business, if, if there are larger public um, peers were trading at, you know, 25 or 30 times revenue and, you know, historically, and now they're trading at 10 or 15 times revenue. Um, that's a very big difference and new investment is going to reference that. And so there are a lot of companies at all stages where they're, they love to talk about their large, their large cap peers, so to speak, trading at 30 times revenue 
there, there is, a, you know, as was mentioned, a valuation discount for venture. So they say, hey, my peers are trading at 30, you know, give me a 15 or 20 times, you know, revenue multiple and I'm, you know, and I'm growing my revenue and there we go. If that's fallen in half, their valuation has fallen in half. So that's one parameter. The, the next is what the fate is the stage of the company. Um, and there's a big difference, especially now because of the valuation point. Ideally, if companies don't need to raise new funds right now, or let's say in the next six to nine months throughout the rest of the year, they probably shouldn't because there'll be a lot of haggling and valuation discovery. So safer to not have to go to the financing market. Um, some businesses did a great job of raising a lot of money over the last 12 or 18 months and are sitting with a lot of cash on their balance sheet. They're in a much stronger position um, to just... I think that we have some technical issues with uh, Craig connection, but uh, I hope that he can come back. Uh, but Craig, maybe you can continue with these different phases. Sure. Yeah, and Greg did a good job uh, teeing up a bunch of things around valuations. Like, look, look. Fundamentally, um, in our view uh, and my view, valuations were way too high for many companies and many sectors. The view that investors had in what they thought they could get for returns assumed variables that were almost impossible. Maybe not completely impossible, Kicked but out. the probability extraordinarily low. So when you look at you know valuations of a lot of companies and stocks that have dropped, my wife was asking me, I don't understand. These seem like good companies. Doesn't mean they're not good companies. It means that people had pushed up the price so high that the companies had to grow so quickly and maintain such great margins and profitability for that math to even remotely make sense that now you see any little fracture in that at all and all of a sudden people say oh wow gee this kind of business plan that's has a very low probability of success has put such a high valuation on it and the one thing that we have never seen before uh, in stock markets or in investing is having multiple historically trillion dollar companies and we talked at Starmount Capital about the massive market risks that we believed people were underestimating, where if you think of a, a stock like Tesla, and, and I own a Tesla car, and this isn't negative against Tesla, I think they're a great business, make great products and so forth. But if you think about a trillion dollar valuation, if it lost 90% of its value, you'd still have to believe it's worth $100 billion dollars. A hundred billion dollar business is a very substantial company. I, I believe worth it more than any other automaker in the world by a few times. And that may not be a perfect example, right? Nothing is a silver bullet, but just conceptually the impact that can have. And you look at cryptocurrencies and how much money has been eroded to, from my perspective, when I think back to investing in the late nineties, to me, it was almost inevitable that many, and if not most, of those businesses could go to zero. And I don't know that investors were really understanding that dynamic where, and that's a big part of the venture world, right? On average, right, venture capital companies have approximately 90% probability of failure. And failure doesn't mean you lose 10%. It means generally you lose 100% of your money in many of those businesses. So what we would estimate um, based on what we're seeing happening now, where a lot of companies, as Greg mentioned, are reducing in value of the public companies, that then trickles down to valuations and to capital inflows into venture. So right now, how many people do you know that are saying, oh, I want to put some more money in venture and big tech? It might be the smartest thing to do. Right, that's possible. Often you want to try to buy low and sell high. Uh, unfortunately, that's hard to time and hard to predict. And many still view um, rolling valuations of a lot of companies still too high. So he, herein lies the problem for a lot of venture, if not managed well, liquidity. 
you have to be able to ride through markets. And, and Greg touched on this saying, if you can afford not to raise money for the next six to nine months, that financially could really be great for you. Now, if you have the ability to shore up some liquidity and get some additional liquidity right now, that's probably intelligent, but you need to be able to weather storms, keeping your leverage low, keeping your cash flow coverage strong, keeping your, keeping your liquidity strong so that you can work through macroeconomic and idiosyncratic risks. Unfortunately, a lot of venture is so focused on top line revenue growth and not having liquidity or profitability that it can be very hard for them to all of a sudden manage through down rounds and challenges because let's talk about another big driver of inflation again, which is talent. And I always like to bring the realism of this kind of bottoms up in people's perspective. If you're a biz, if you're an employee at a tech company and you're pumped up and you think you're going to make a ton of money, and let's be clear, that's the, the view of a lot of those business owners. Now, all of a sudden, you're like, hmm, we just had a 50% down round or a 75% down round. Because guess what? Somehow, many of these businesses are going to need to try to get liquidity if they can get it. Many of them probably will not be able to get it and will probably go bankrupt, just like we saw in, in the late 90s, early 2000s. Other ones will take dramatic haircuts. You, know, you saw WeWork when it went from almost IPO at a $47 billion target market cap down to $7 billion at the time. That happened in two weeks. Um, it somehow it didn't kind of phase the market and have people you know, realize the risks out there because I think fear and greed are still your basic human drivers of emotion that way when it comes to investing. And it had been a greed on economy. And when people invest a bit and it works out, they get more complacent and more trusting of it as if things are fundamentally working versus just momentum and not understanding the momentum is rarely and almost never flat. It's either this or this. And right now, I think we're in down momentum. You saw it yesterday, markets and, and what happened and, you know, dramatic drop, biggest since, um, you know, the pandemic really became clearly a real thing in um, June 2020, I believe. And I think that you'll see, again, a lot of these companies not be able to raise capital, uh, probably be challenged to retain certain employees. And that is really hard for businesses. Uh, unfortunately, that's going to be the reality, I believe, for many. And some of them will be great businesses and will push and will grind through this and develop great companies at the other end of the rainbow. But I think for a lot of venture and a lot of unprofitable businesses and businesses that can't get into profitability uh, or access enough liquidity, I think it's going to be a tough ride. Uh, yeah, and actually continue from that is that how you see that the main opportunities at the moment, so so that especially as an investor or also if you if you are basically a uh, venture capital funded company or, or target to be that do you see that there are any special areas that is it now good time to start something new because it is often say said that that basically the best companies are creative during crisis is it realistic or is there certain sectors for example military spending is one at least one area that is going up. Uh, Germany alone has basically decided to put 100 billion in into military. Many other countries, also in Europe, uh, also US. Uh, or then, of course, I think that there are also opportunities when the valuations go down. So, what 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 are your feelings? That what are the main opportunities in this market, Craig? Sure. Well, uh, as as um, history does show in uh, in dramatic downturns, that is indeed where some of the most important and valuable companies five or ten years hence are created. Um, but I, what I would say is, we're, you know, if we're in the early stages of that realization of the decline um, in valuation and the difficulty to raise financing. Um, I still feel the next quarter or two is still going to feel very uncomfortable, even for those businesses that ultimately benefit from this um, environment. Um, there's often a painful uh, disconnect between the public and private market valuation. And there's often a painful realization that um, managing businesses 
through this will be more challenging. That does that doesn't happen as quickly as the as the public markets devalue. There, it needs to click in. I think the other point that Brett was making, which is amplified though, is there is this talent shortage within tech, especially. Um, and the prices of, of tech employees have continued to rise, partly due to inflation, partly due to demand. And as noted, many of um, these employees, talented employees, assumed that a lot of their riches were coming from stock options and ever-increasing valuations. So I still think there needs to be, um, and there have been started, Netflix announced some layoffs and some of the larger tech. I think there needs to be a bit of pruning that goes on to put in check some of the cost pieces before there can be that opportunity for the growth and development. But certainly, um, you know, businesses that are better positioned to continue to grow during the, the next year can pick up some of that talent, can hire new talent. Um, I'm just a little bit skeptical that it's going to have that feel good of, hey, we're building a world changing business. Um, I don't think entrepreneurs and founders running businesses are going to feel that way in the next few months. Um, I think that there will be, but history does show that um, there will be that opportunity that however uncomfortable it feels now, some of those founders will be running businesses that will be worth billions down the road. It's just hard to predict which ones right now. That's my lens. Yeah, great points. I uh, think Fred. the, I'll take a slightly, um, different uh, market segment approach to smaller businesses where there are a lot of baby boomer owned smaller businesses where even though today's valuations are not going to be great for them, they're at a inflection point in life that in the developed world we haven't seen before. Meaning we have not seen this many private businesses owned by this old of a demographic population. And so I think that one of the massive opportunities by just volume and size is finding a number of high quality, smaller companies that are going to have low valuations, be able to combine them into a bigger, stronger business that once the economy and the markets get better, you can you know, command a much higher valuation where you can maybe be buying EBITDA, uh, for example, at five or six or seven times and build that up into a bigger company that can be a middle market business where valuations are higher. And, you know, one day maybe sell it at a 10 or 12 times EBITDA multiple. And I think that there's a vast opportunity there. And then you can have related opportunities where we're helping a company right now, for example, um, acquire a business in India where they're getting, you know, they already work with them. They're getting some lower cost labor by doing it to assist with, you know, what Greg and I have been talking about around labor challenges. And I, I agree that even though there are layoffs, it takes a while. And I would say at least a few quarters for people to mentally recalibrate and say, Oh, I'm, I'll, I'll be kind of facetious here. I'm not a billionaire overnight. Um, you know, that's kind of what I've been telling myself and thinking that is going to happen. And uh, of course, probability once again is not on their side, but that's how they've geared themselves. And so especially people, who graduated from undergrad in 2010 or later, they have never really seen a recession. They've been born into one of the longest expansionary periods that we've had in history, putting the pandemic abnormal blip aside, because other than in commercial banking and a few sectors where there was a little bit of layoffs, there weren't much. So, for example, investment banking, driving up wages and talent because they were losing people to startups and all these other things, those are typically quite volatile careers. Um, but these young business people don't know that because they haven't seen it. And so if year after year, it's just like momentum-based investing. If you see the same pattern repeating, you become complacent that that pattern will continue to repeat itself. And so I think that a lot of people are going to be surprised to what happens in a world where there are layoffs and not only are they laid off and say, oh, well, so what? But you're laid off in an environment where other people are not hiring. And so what becomes a very real dynamic. But that will take people probably a couple or a few quarters to say, wow, this is pretty tough. I'm not bouncing right back. I don't have 10 other job offers. 
I'm talking to other people, but they're not acting. They're not sure if they're going to hire. I think you'll see a lot of people pausing on hiring, pausing on growth spending. And all of these things have an amplifying um, intercorrelated effect of a spiral down until things start to come back up. And I don't think we're, I don't think this is going to be a V uh, shaped, I'll call it at minimum mini recession. I think at minimum, it's going to be a U shaped recession. I think some of the black swans, including geopolitical risks are still out there. So that's where I see one of the opportunities is finding profitable businesses that are sustainable that you can build to bigger companies. And then presumably in a year or so, there'll be a bit of a recalibration around economic expectations of employees where realism sinks in, which will take time. Then you can perhaps start to pick up some really good talent at more um, rational prices because some of the talent costs are just like valuations of companies where if everything doesn't perfectly fire in all cylinders, it's not really sustainable. And that's what business owners um, have been pitching to employees that, hey, your stock's going to be worth as great. said a ton of money. We're going to grow. We're going to do this. But probability is not really there. It's a low probability that happens. And so I think that there will be an opportunity if you have a good business built and you're keeping your eyes on talent and keeping your, your fishing um, you know, lines out in the water, that you can probably find some high quality talent in a year or so from now once you know, I think that the market probably goes through some material increased disruption. Yeah, yeah, those are really, really great points. And actually, it was very interesting to hear your comment about this baby boomer old company, basically people who are retiring and they have problems to sell their companies because I, I, I have just one case on my table uh, to invest in one company that is going to make buyouts in that area. And uh, uh, so, so it was great to hear your comment. And, and it's a good opportunity. And, and we've been and doing all, it for a long time. Yeah, and, and also, actually, my feeling when operated more on early phase startups, uh, that bootstrapping can be again a good option also for those people who are ready to, to do it. But I, I totally understand also your point that, that, for example, people who have seen the last 10 years and they have got immediately excellent funding round immediately nice uh, salaries to everybody and promises how this will be in, uh, this will be unicorn in three years it it's not easy to go to bootstrapping but of course there are people who are able to do it also and and often these kind of times can be excellent time to start in that way um, yeah we we have a it can be I, I would caution people on one thing though i've i've started a number of businesses over my career including star mountain capital when i launched star mountain capital in 2010 i assumed from the previous success relationships that it would be a lot easier that time around what i found and i and i had um, not appreciated how tough it can be to raise capital in a market downturn for anybody mm -hmm. Yeah. So that that I, I wouldn't take that for granted. When people start to feel concerned about spending, they're concerned about investing. People like Warren Buffett, of course, will say, you know, when others are fearful, you know, be greedy, and when others are greedy, be fearful, and so forth. But nonetheless, the the, the average kind of human psychology is to look left, look right, get comfort from other people. And so, given that that is the averages and that is the masses, it means it's hard to find super intelligent, sophisticated investors that are willing to back you at what is often really the right time. Um, mm. But you have to dig harder to find, yeah. I think, those sophisticated I, investors. I can, say, I, can, I can say that I'm old enough to remember also 2000 and 2001. And we actually started one startup 2001. And I think that the first three years were just surviving, basically make some money. But after 2004, 2005, the world started to look very different. Uh, we, we have a, a less than 10 minutes left uh, so that uh, may, maybe we, we can try to uh, conclude something. Uh, I think that we have covered quite well that how the market looks look 
as whole and and also also about the different phases but uh, may, maybe one interesting question is that when people are now thinking investments and other people are looking for uh, investors uh, what do you think that what are the most important factors uh, basically uh, to 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 get investment happen we we have all already talked that you must be careful with your cost and you must make revenue but do you feel that there are there are some other indicators also that you should especially follow if you want to be active in this market Craig, active start? as an investor just to clarify yeah, active, active as an investor question. yes as an investor not an entrepreneur right yeah uh, I, I think it, you know, what, one element, and, and I'm sure Brett can compliment this. I mean, what, one element, that, you know, to pull on some of the threads we were talking about earlier, um, an investor now um, should have a much stronger lens on the capabilities of the management team. That's always one of the top three factors. If you ask any investor, it's management. But in this environment, as we've just talked about, um, management is that much more important and maybe more experienced management is more helpful than more you know, visionary management. And I think what we've seen in the last few years of the, the rise in venture funding of businesses and the valuations is it, they are priced for perfection on the valuation side. And a lot of latitude has been given to the capabilities of the management team to navigate and grow a business. Um, and now when we're in a more disruptive environment, I think investors lens will now turn to, well, have you done this before? Have you ever managed in a downturn? You know, have you ever grown a business while doing successive fundraises in the past to show that, you know, you can do both at the same time because raising money is very disruptive to running a business. Some people are good marketers, can raising money. Others are strong operators. It's very hard to be able to do both at once. So I think there's going to be a refocus on that as um, as one of the many things that an investor would look at. But I'm sure Brett can add to that list as well. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah I agree. And in fact, um, I, um, I I do triathlons, and so I, I listen to audiobooks and podcasts often during the some of the easier impact um, running in particular. I not quite um, uh, willing to listen to music while I'm outside bike riding, but during the long runs, I do that. And right now I'm listening to one of the books uh, from McKinsey Consulting on CEOs, and they actually had a, a view on predictiveness that, in fact, the CEO accounts for perhaps up to 40 or 45 percent of the probability of success. The other ones are more macro and balance sheets. So what's the end sector your business is in? What's the shape of your balance sheet? So again, having really fundamental based investing, I think is critical. So I would say for an investor, one, get the macro right. Um, you know, Make sure that there is a high quality market opportunity and that adoption for it is ready because that can be one thing that's difficult is this might make a lot of sense, but are people, businesses or consumers willing and able to pay for it. Um, then make sure you've got the talented team and management together. And I agree with Greg, I think there's a, uh, there will probably be a higher focus on business owners that have managed during duress and stress, managing employees when everybody's having fun, popping champagne, as I like to call it, is much easier than it is, hey, things are tough, you know, we're grinding through, but hang in there, we're going to get through this together. You know, you almost think of like a, a sports team and working together and banding together, even though they're down in the first half. And so you, you need, I think, that grit and the perseverance and the cultural organization behind that. So at Star Mountain Capital, for example, we have about 60 full-time employees and 40 operating partners. We're 100% employee owned. And I give carried interest profits to 100% of our team. So we want everybody driving, banding together, thinking about opportunities, how you treat customers, how you treat interns, how you treat each other, and really aligning people 
to the outcomes that you want, I think is really crucial. The depth of the, the, depth of the team, um, some of you may have listened to some of Ray Dalio's content. I think he has a lot of phenomenal content in his principles. And you know, he talks a lot about different executives and it's hard to find people that really have it all as a leader. And so to Greg's point, having depth of a team, some are maybe great at marketing and being visionaries, and, and they may need to be paired with somebody that's a rock star, just execution oriented person. Um, and I think self-awareness to that's important. And for investors asking the CEO, what, what are your core strengths? What are your core weaknesses? And maybe there's better ways of, of asking that, but you know, people should be self-aware and say, look, here's what I'm really good at. Here's where I'm not quite as good. And therefore, for our biz to be successful, that's why I've brought this or these partners on to help complement um, my strengths and what our business needs. And I think that self-awareness is really important to understanding uh, the management team. And then um, lastly, liquidity. Again, liquidity is critical. So making sure if you're investing in a business, it's properly funded and that it can manage through its, you know, what we like to call kind of management case, base case and downside case. Can it still be successful in a downside case? Does it have enough liquidity to grind through? Because we, we all know the old adage of things always cost two to three times more money and take two to three times longer to achieve than we hope they will. And then that's the case with many great businesses from Apple to Microsoft when you look back over time. And I, and I think that's important to keep in mind if you want a higher probability outcome. It doesn't mean that you don't get hit by lightning and get lucky. But if you're looking for a probability weighted outcome, I think those are some critical factors. Okay, thank you. Uh, excellent points. And uh, I think that we are running out of the time but I think that the kind of summary of all this is that uh, that we definitely have uh, quite a lot of uncertainty in the market. We don't know yet uh, what's going to happen and how long this situation is going to take. And that's why you must be prepared that it's going to take some time. And uh, especially I think that uh, it was a great point what you both mentioned that the, the management team the experience, the management team, and capability also to realize the situation so that they they don't only think that the, uh, the good time can continue, that they, they are humble enough to understand that, that uh, they must make hard decisions, they need the customers, they need money from customers, and they must also keep control of the cost. Excellent. Thank you. I think that this has been a great discussion and uh, uh, I hope that uh, everybody has liked it and, uh, 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 and we will see how it goes. But I think that this has been a good, good way to, to, to summarize that what is the outlook at the moment. Thank you very much. Uh, see you later. Great. Bye Thank now. you. Thank you.